district. In partnership with the Verona Area School District, our three school districts have come together for the purpose of providing you this opportunity to hear straight from these amazing candidates' uh, uh, thoughts, their insights. Uh, they have been presented with about uh, nine questions uh, in advance of tonight's event. But before I steal any more thunder from Natalie Broderick, Natalie is going to be our uh, MC for the evening. Uh, and then uh, she will explain a little bit more about how tonight's all set up. Can we welcome Natalie, please? Thank you, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to the candidate forum for the 80th Assembly seat. My name is Natalie Broderick, and I will be a senior at Mount Cork High School this fall. We are pleased that you are here this evening. I'm pleased to introduce, from left to right, Four of the seven candidates vying for this vacancy. Mr. Mike Baer, Mr. Nathan Gravine, Mrs. Anna Halverson, and Mr. Chad Kapp. <laughs> candidates Jacob Lugenbull, Doug Steinberg, and Dale Yers declined our invitation, did not respond to our invitations, or were unable to attend due to prior commitments, respectively. This forum is jointly hosted by the Mount Cora Area School District, New Glarus School District, and the Verona Area School District. I am joined tonight by students from Mount Cora and New Glarus. I'm Natalie Roger, as stated before. This is to my left, Samuel Copeland from New Glarus, and Jordan Roon from New Glarus, Catherine Straka from Mount Cora, and finally Peyton Almquist, also from Mount Cora. At this time, I would like to recognize any Board of Education members present this evening. Please stand. Each candidate received the questions in advance of the forum. Given the number of questions and candidates, there will be time allocated for each candidate to provide their response. Sam will be our timekeeper. With one minute remaining in each candidate's response time, Sam will raise his hand to alert the candidate. If time permits, additional questions may be asked. So, again, thank you for participating in our candidate forum. It will be recorded and shared broadly with the public, and we have invited the media to attend. The following questions will be shared by us students. I'm going to now start with the first question. Please tell us about the experiences you've had that have positioned you for this role. It would be especially helpful to share how you have been connected to your community's schools. I would like to start this question with Mr. Mike Baer. All right, well, thank you, Natalie. Um, yeah. <laughs> that'll, that'll help. <laughs> all right, that definitely helps, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Natalie, for the question. Thanks to all of you for helping out, and Dr. Salerno, everybody here in Mount Horeb uh, who had a part in this, and uh, New Glarus as well, thank you. Uh, and I'd like to say thank you to Sandy Poe for her long-time service in this seat, uh, many years uh, doing well for us and being one of the, the top people uh, in the line of defense against attacks on education. Uh, and she's done well and leaving some big shoes to fill. Uh, so I might bear uh, experience and expertise to make progress on the challenges that we're facing, including education. Uh, I had more endorsements from educators and uh, public school board members than anyone else in the race. And I want to say the outright, fundamentally, public education is a right. It is a right that we all have, something that we all need to have to be successful in our lives. And we should have that all the way from pre-K all the way through higher education. We shouldn't have two education systems in this country, or in this state in particular. One for those who can afford it, and one for those who can't. There should be one for everyone uh, who wants one. It is a right. My mom was a public high school English teacher. Uh, I've taught uh, graduate public health policy classes. My wife has taught at the law school. We have a lot of uh, teaching experience in our family, uh, and we certainly uh, hold that belief that public education is a right. Uh, I went to public schools myself. Uh, my son goes to be a second grader uh, in Verona Public Schools, uh, and my other son will be there next year. Uh, to the point of the question about connection to our schools, uh, beyond having you know, just the two kids there, although the past two years have been sort of a uh, study in extremes of being connected to school or not. His kindergarten year, my older son's kindergarten year, was all virtual, so done on an iPad in his room with us sitting there for hours with him. 
So we felt very connected and very close to what was happening. Uh, and then this past year, going back to in-person, we felt very disconnected because of the precautions that were in place and sort of not being able to be in the classroom and around as much as we would have liked to. So we were there, uh, you know, for one 10-minute poster presentation and one day, I think it was the second to last day of school for a lunch. So we've had you know, sort of both experiences. Uh, I'm also on the Dane County Board. I've been su supportive of our Building Bridges program, which is a mental health, school-based mental health program uh, for students and also helps secure additional uh, COVID relief funding for mental health. I'm the owner of the Beer Garden Ulrich Park, fun little side business gig of mine. We do a lot of uh, benefit evenings for teacher recognition and for PTOs to do fundraising there. In my day job, I'm, I'm a full-time advocate for uh, eliminating poverty and all of its causes, uh, including hunger and things that are the reasons why students are not successful outside of the four walls of their school. Um, and again, education is a right. I've got experience and expertise, and I'll be a relentless advocate for our schools, for our educators, and for our students.
leaving school and then entering adult services, which then I worked in that capacity in Dane County, in every school district in Dane County. So I worked with families and students. Um, often the students in special education are supported by the dis school district from the time they're three. So this is a really, really big change for families, and I really enjoy getting to help them navigate those complicated systems. Uh, and then in my current role as a supervisor at the nonprofit agency I work for, I continue to do that work, helping transition age youth with disabilities, enter adult services with the type of employment they want, like living meaningful lives, like really everything we want for all of our students when they exit high school. Uh, I serve on a Wisconsin, it's a, it's a work group with statewide leadership called Wisconsin Coordinating on Transition, where we really look at system-wide issues to help students with disabilities be successful in school. So as a, I'm also a parent of a seven-year-old in the Nonpartum Public Schools, and I've been fortunate enough to meet with the fantastic leadership of the Nonpartum Area School District talking about common sense gun safety in schools, informing parents and students about safe gun storage, uh, and then also on the diversity, equity, and inclusion curriculum that Nonpartum Area School District is doing excellent work with Nehemiah House on. And I got to speak at school board meetings in support of that work. So that's my experience. You can see I care about this a lot. I'm so excited for this event. Um, those are the skills and experiences I would bring to the table as your next state rep. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, first, my name is Chad Kemp. I want to thank everyone for being here, um, particularly these young students. It's a really nice day out. Mike and I were talking about this before we walked in here. You guys do not need to be here, so I'm very impressed that you guys are. So you know, thank you for, for attending. Um, again, my name is Chad Kemp. I'm currently the City Council President of the City of Verona. Um, I actually went to Verona K-12, if you can believe that. I started school at Verona in 1984. I was bused in from Fitchburg. I grew up in a neighborhood called Seminole Forest. My parents came to the Madison area by way of Milwaukee. Um, my dad went to medical school here and we never really left. So I asked my parents, why did you pick Verona? Because we lived kind of on the near west side and she said, we knew that they had really good schools. So that's how I ended up in the Verona School District. Uh, upon graduation, I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison for both undergraduate and law school. I've said this story before, people tend to think it's kind of funny. When I graduated from undergrad, I had a degree in political science and, and Afro-American studies. And my dad came up to me and said, well, if you have those two and a bus pass, you can get on the bus. So you're probably gonna need, you're gonna need to do something else. So, so I ended up going to, to, to law school. Um, the, the key, in my family, education has always been the key. That's what my parents taught me. Um, as a child, they said, you need to do well in school, you need to work hard, because if you achieve that, no one can take that away from you. And right now, we're kind of at a precipice. I think the education system in our state is teetering on the brink. COVID has done a number on teachers. The Act 10 has done a number on teachers. We've seen a lot of the people have to retire. We have to find a way to bring back the value um, that we all got in our education. A lot of kids may not be getting the education that I was fortunate to receive, and I graduated 25 years ago. Um, I have three small children in the Verona Area School District. Ironically, some of them are literally in the exact same classrooms that I, I was in, um, and they're, they're growing up and they're having a good time uh, getting an education, but I don't want our kids to fall behind. Um, everyone in this room was fortunate to have teachers that were active and influential in our lives. I want to make sure that the kids that are coming up in the next generation have teachers that are active and influential in their lives and are proud of what they, what they do. And quite frankly, that they're not demonized for what they do. It's a lot to be a teacher. It's really hard work. you got to want it. you got to want to wake up and, and educate someone else's child. That's not easy. So I think what we can, we can do in, over the next couple years here, we can work to bring back that, uh, that influence that teachers have in children. We can bring back the pride in the job, and we can make sure that our kids continue to receive a good and solid education. Thank you. Uh, if I could direct you to question two. Wisconsin state law requires a revenue limit for schools. Since 2015, there have been very modest increases to per pupil funding from the legislature. In fact, this past budget biennium approved zero dollars per pupil increase for the last school year and next. Meanwhile, the inflationary pressures have driven up costs. 
Please talk about your vision for funding Wisconsin schools and how you would work within the legislature to advocate for that vision. If you have five minutes, uh, if we could start with Mr. Craig. Well, thank you very much. Um, funding for our schools is, is very important. The, um, uh, it's actually kind of surprising. Um, I don't know, you know, our governor actually was from Tom too, so I actually knew him as well, because he started his whole career in the city of Toma. Um, since then, he was just a um, vice, vice principal there, and uh, he was there for a short period of time, and then he bounced around throughout the state as superintendent. And for uh, the schools to see a, a zero dollar per pupil increase was um, a very hit, very hard hit for all our schools throughout Wisconsin. Uh, we have to take a, a good step back and uh, we have to put money into our schools. We have to uh, make our schools not only safe, but uh, we have to um, make a good atmosphere for our schools. And, and this comes from, from taxpayer money. And uh, to see a zero dollar per pupil you know, since 2015 is, is pretty bad. And uh, I like, when I get in, uh, this, this is definitely gonna change. Uh, we, we have to do something with our schools. We have, to, we have to put money into our future. And our future is the kids. And we, we can't go forward unless, unless we start there. Thank you. So, <clears throat> Quite frankly, we need to overhaul the way we fund schools in Wisconsin. This, this method of funding schools with revenue limits is archaic, ineffective. The school funding formula is incredibly complicated. The handful of people who understand it, probably one of which is Dr. Salerno, um, <laughs> I commend you. Uh, but it leads to inequities, and it's just, it's not effective. The, the revenue cap was set in the 90s, and it's, it's barely, uh, barely crept up at all, and it forces most districts, in, in the 80th district too, in our district, it forces a lot of districts to go to referendum all the time. Luckily in our district, these often pass because the people of Wisconsin are way ahead of the extremist right wings in control of the legislature. Um, but it's not sustainable and it's not equitable. Luckily, Governor Evers, who side note, we must reelect. I'm gonna say that over and over again throughout this, um, he is an expert, he knows this inside and out. I wanna be a good partner to him in the assembly to try to really make some serious changes so that we're not constantly having to put band-aids on and try to creep up the revenue limit, which clearly has not been happening. So we know what works in schools. We have to invest in evidence-based programs and policies that work for all students. This takes money, this takes building the political will to wrench control of our legislature out of the hands of right-wing extremists. Um, and that's my experience. I haven't mentioned this yet, but I'm an activist with Moms Demand Action. I've been organizing to build power all over the state and the country. Uh, we saw the results of that last month when we got the first significant piece of gun safety legislation through Congress in over 30 years. But that's what we have to do in the Assembly is build power so we can solve big problems like this, like changing the way that we fund school districts in Wisconsin. Yes, this, this is a good question. Um, I don't know, most of you probably know this, but Wisconsin has a, a tradition or a history of uh, two-thirds revenue uh, funding for K-12 education. And over the years, that has been cut dramatically, unfortunately, by Governor Walker and the Republicans. What I would like to see happen, first and foremost, is um, um, we need to restore that, we need to go beyond that. Governor Evers, who was actually the superintendent of Verona when I went there, um, in sixth and seventh and eighth and ninth grade, his, kid, his twins, Katie and, and um, Nick, were in ninth grade. He has actually used his veto pen to try and restore some of that. And that's a, that's a good thing. That's just the first step. But once we commit to that two thirds, we need to go beyond that. Um, right now, we're looking at a $3.8 billion surplus in the state. Okay, we could be using some of those funds to fund our schools. When, when students and when teachers have to wait every year to find out if they're gonna have the funds to fund specific programs, that's a tenuous position to be in. It's not the position that I would want to be in if I were a teacher. Certainly wouldn't want to be in that position if I were a student. So one thing that we could also do is we could pair down the manufacturing and ag tax credit that we have here in the state to have a bigger pool of money 
to draw in, in for education. So there's a number of options that we can do. But as Anna stated, you have to have the political will and the, and the ability to try and get those things done. Now, Democrats realistically are in the minority in the legislature, and that's a, that's a fact. But you have to be willing to work with other people to try and push these things through. Over time, the hope would be that you'd be back in the majority, and you have to have the people in place prepared, ready to take that type of action. I want to make sure that my kids' schools are fully funded and they're bastions for, for education. We don't want to have to scrape together dollars every year trying to figure out how we're going to make this work. So those are just a few of the things that we can start off with. I think this will go to Mike. Yeah, thank you. Uh, th this is a complex topic and, and a very complex formula that goes into how we figure out how we fund our schools. And it's one that desperately needs attention, desperately needs reform, and probably needs full transformation, full overhaul. Um, for the past 10 years, inflation has been going up, you know, up at a rate that's pretty steady, while school funding has been on a much smaller, flatter, or much flatter trend line. Uh, and that's been exacerbated the last year, likely will be more this coming year. Uh, and so we have to do something. There's three variables that really we have to look at. What is the cost of education? That's the one that's going up. What will we fund at a state level? That's been fairly flat. Uh, Zero dollar per pupil increase in this budget. And then what can the local school board do to raise uh, the taxes to be able to fund schools? Uh, and because of this revenue limit, the question uh, being about the revenue limit, they can't do what they need to do at a local level. It's taking power away from them. So. In this current state budget, yes, there's two-thirds funding from the state. It goes back longer than Governor Walker. It went back to Governor Doyle did cut to this funding uh, amount as well. So both sides guilty here of cutting education in the last uh, two administrations. Um, and we have to do better. Our students must have better. Our teachers must have better. So having two out of the three pieces of the pie funded by the state is good. Having one-third left to the local level, also good, but it can't be, they can't make it what they need it to be because of this revenue limit. The funding pie is the size of the middle school when we need it to be the size of the high school. It's just not enough at this point. So two thirds is good, but it's not enough, it's not big enough. Um, and again, the revenue limit takes the power away from the local level to be able to do what local school boards know they need to do. Needs in Belleville, very different from needs in uh, Mount Horror, very different from Milwaukee or Manitowoc or anywhere else. Um, so when Governor Evers signed this last budget, I was one of the few very vocal critics of that. Uh, I'm a lobbyist in my day job, and I was saying, why are we giving tax cuts to rich people at the same time that we're not providing enough, enough, enough for our schools? Uh, and I got a few calls about that, but I think that's the kind of advocate that schools, students, and teachers are looking for, is someone who will take that tough stand and say, we need more, we need to do better. Uh, and that's the kind that I'll be. And we could certainly find funding uh, in other places. We are uh, a state that has not legalized marijuana. That's something that we should do for criminal and medical use. Uh, we are giving our tax dollars to Minnesota, Michigan, Illinois, paying for schools in Minneapolis, Detroit, Chicago, and they could be paying for schools here with those tax. We could be paying for schools here with those tax dollars. We could also expand, get rid of that uh, uh, manufacturing and egg credit. We could be expanding Badger Care. All of that would create billions of dollars. It could be funding to schools, roads, everything that we could possibly need. Um, but we don't have the political will to do those things at this moment. And I'm going to be an advocate for doing those things. The main problem with when we don't have enough funding is we have to go to a referendum, an operating referendum. We're doing that in the Verona schools. Middleton is doing that. Belleville likely doing that. Other schools have been thinking about it in this district too. Oregon, and Polaris. And that's a result of this pressure from the state level not having enough funding, not getting enough from the state, and the local level not being able to raise what it needs to raise. So we have to do better for our students in our schools, and it starts with providing the funding that's necessary. Okay, I'd like to direct your attention to question three. Because the people funding and revenue limits have not kept up with inflation, a record number of school districts look to operational referendums to support the basic needs of their schools. Against this backdrop, the needs of our young people continue to grow. Specifically, how would you address funding for mental health needs, funding for special education students, and distribution of federal school safety dollars? You have five minutes to answer this question, and we'll start with Ms. Alderson. All right, so mental health. Coming out of COVID the last 
couple years. I'd like to think we're truly coming out of it. I think so many of us dealt with mental health challenges and our young people were no exception. Uh, on top of that, they have to deal with things like imagining a future with climate disaster, school shootings, being worried about being unsafe at school, um, and even just their reproductive rights under attack for, for young people. So, so it's hard times right now, and, and we've seen, we've been in hard times before in our country, right? And our country, there's never been a point in our country where everyone was safe and okay. So we're fighting for a better future here, and we have to invest in more professional mental health professionals in schools to create more capacity. I know the Mount Area School District partners with Oregon Mental Health, and, uh, but they have a huge wait list, it's my understanding, and we also have huge wait lists in our community. That's some of what I do during my, my day job is try to help people find services so they, with people with disabilities, um, find services, and it's really hard right now, even with good insurance, not let alone if you're on Medicaid. So we have to increase school capacity for mental health services, and we have to increase community capacity for mental health services. I could talk about each one of these for far too long, so I'm gonna try to move on here. Special education. So school districts in Wisconsin are reimbursed at under 30% for what it costs to provide a, a good education for a student who needs special ed services. In 2021, Governor Evers proposed a budget that called for an increase um, of 60%, an increase to 60% reimbursement, which would be better, but why in the world are we not reimbursing school districts 100% for what it costs to educate a student who needs special education services? I've seen firsthand the way that this kind of lack of funding pits programs and teachers against students and families when the common enemy, again, is an extremist legislature that is far to the right of the people of Wisconsin. School safety dollars. So. Um, as I mentioned, I do a lot of work in, with Moms in Action as a volunteer. We have been working on building power. The reason why school districts are getting a bunch of money soon uh, for school safety is because of the legislation that was passed in June, which is excellent. So we got some money to spend, right? What should schools do with it? So there are a few things we know. We know that 80% of school shooters get their guns from their homes. So we have to address access to guns and we have to address making our communities safer. We cannot have safe schools until we have safe communities. That's just a fact. So we have to continue to build the kind of power to get more gun, common sense gun safety legislation through in our country and in our state. Um, that is something that is a huge priority for me in the legislature. There are, what else do we know? We know that some practices that have been proposed by Unfortunately, sitting lawmakers in Wisconsin, like arming teachers, do not work, should not even be discussed. Uh, active shooter drills, too. These, these are not shown to be effective. We're basically telling our students, the onus is on you to protect yourself from assault rifles. It does not work, and it causes more stress and anxiety for our students. So we need to invest in evidence-based programs that truly work. And we have the research, he knows, we know what those are. In addition to addressing access to guns, uh, some of these programs are called school-based threat assessment programs where you help schools build, in, you know, you invest in infrastructure like anonymous chip lines, uh, social media monitoring so that members of the school community can have a good method of alerting authorities and alerting um, school leadership when they think someone might be a threat to others. Um, and then again, it goes back to investing in mental health services too, so that all kids can get what they need. So I think all of these are deserving of, of uh, you know, a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of, you know, cons consultation with educators, with students, with, um, and with experts who have done the research and know, know what works in schools. Thank you, yes, this is a, uh, this question kind of touches on what we've already discussed and why uh, revenue limits are by nature destructive. Um, across the state, you can, you can see how that's affected not only suburban schools where we live, but then also rural schools and urban schools. And whether we believe it or not, um, whether you're in a school in the inner city of Milwaukee or if you're out in the suburbs here in Mount Corp or Verona or you're up north in, in a very rural area, the different or the similarities are much more um, are much more common than the, than the differences between all of us. All of us want to make sure our children have good public schools. All of us want to make sure that our children get an education. Now, with respect to special education, 
Um, Governor Evers has funded special, or before Governor Evers, special education was on, the funding for that was on a drastic downward trend. And that's just a fact statistically. The, the funds that were going towards special education were on a downward trajectory. Um, in the last budget, however, he created a $97 million increase to special uh, to special education reimbursement. We need to make sure we continue to do that good work first and foremost. I don't know if anyone knows this in this room, but in 2018, 2019, um, there was a Republican-led commission that recommended a reimbursement percentage of 16, 60%. We still haven't done that yet. We've been doing moderate increases for special education in that time frame. Like Anna said, why aren't we doing more to make sure that people have the special education that they need? That's very simple. It's a very simple thing to do. Our own experts are telling them to do it, and they haven't done it yet. With respect to mental health education, again, the more we can fund, the better. Obviously, with COVID, we've seen a lot of an increase in mental health issues and mental health crises. I have three children. One of my children struggled with having school at home. The other one thrived. It was very difficult for my older son. We need to make sure that we give children access to the mental health care needs that they, that they have. They may not be able to have that at home. They may be in situations where their families don't have access to good health care. If we can step in and help those children at an early age and make sure they have access to mental health care, that may prevent some of the things that we see happening, which leads me to number two, or number three, I'm sorry, um, public safety dollars. Again, these all kind of lead into each other. But we need to, again, make sure that we're funding public safety and school safety at a, as a top priority. When I went to school, I never had to imagine someone coming in to the Verona Area Middle School or high school and shooting a classroom. That was not a thought. We are living in a different world. One, one of the things I'm saying in this campaign is common solutions in uncommon times. It's not common to have to wonder if your child is going to come home or not. So we need to make sure that we're properly funding anything we can with respect to public safety, uh, school safety, I should say. We want to make sure that we have the experts inside of the schools that can cite a potential uh, shooter or a child that is troubled. Um, there was a child that, um, that shot, uh, I can't remember what school it was, but he, the, the school district warned the parents that he was a, po a possible shooter. They were actually in the building that day, and then they left, and he actually shot the entire school up and killed a number of people. That's horrible, no one should ever have to live with that. And so we need to make sure that the funding is there for children to receive the mental health care that they need. We need to make sure obviously that there's funding for special education. And then finally we need to make sure that the safety of our children is our number one priority. Well, the question asked uh, first about referendums and they're just simply not the solution. Uh, I think they're more an education of a problem that if you've gotten to a point where you need to ask taxpayers for more dollars at a lower level, you've probably created, you're, you're in some sort of problem. And likely that was from not having enough dollars at the state level and back to the revenue limit, not being able to tax at the local level what you, what you need. Um, so they're unreliable, they're uncertain, and I think we have you know enough privilege in, in communities in this district that they're likely going to be successful. But in the event that they're not, you've got a pretty serious problem on your hands and then you're in the territory of cuts and, and having to figure out how you're gonna fund having a school open without the funds that you need. Uh, and the places that are likely to struggle are these things, these three topics that the question asked about. Mental health needs, special education, and school safety. Uh, on mental health, again, it was part of uh, securing dollars at the county level, the COVID relief dollars for mental health and the supportive um, county-based programming for mental health and the expansion there. But there simply is not enough available services in the community Connecting schools to those services can be difficult. Getting students what they need, again, also difficult. Um, I think the another issue at the moment is a lot of the dollars that are flowing into these three problems are one-time dollars from the federal government, either through CARES funding uh, or ARPA funding. And we're going to come to a point in a couple of years, if not sooner, where we have to fill in those holes with sustainable dollars. And so I feel for school board members who are going to have to create budgets to fill in those holes, but that's the situation that we've been put in, unfortunately, by both the pandemic and the available funding sources. Um, on special education, I, you know, my sister Sue has a really profound learning disability, still lives with my dad, and uh, when she was growing up, she's over 50 now, she went to a segregated school. Uh, when I was growing up, they all students with disabilities, we were together and integrated. 
but there were still times when obviously there's separation that happens and integration is still something to, to fully strive for. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act was something I worked on strengthening. Uh, my first job out of college, I worked for Senator Russ Feingold. Uh, I took a strong interest in disability issues because of my sister. Uh, and and we, we accomplished a lot. A education for a student with a disability is a right because of that law, and we should fund it as a right, as an entitlement, as a matter of state policy, as a matter of state funding. Uh, and that will take dollars, but those dollars, again, are there. Uh, and then school safety, you know, my son was in first grade, as I said, and this was the first time because of the, the COVID year dropping him off after one of these school shootings, after the shooting in Uvalde. And they really hit different. And I don't like the feeling, I don't think any parent should have to have that feeling of giving a kid an extra hug at drop off, thinking, here's, you know, a hug for today, one for what if. It's not a thing that we should have to feel. It's not a thing that any student in a school should have to fear when they're getting their education that they have a right to, that they're uh, unsafe in some way. Their safety is our number one priority and must be. The people with the response in Uvalde, they had everything they needed within minutes. More dollars for hardening schools, sure, can be helpful. But what we need is a comprehensive solution that really gets to the prevention of these situations, prevention of these incidents at the outset, not funding for what happens when somebody has already gotten through the war with the gun. We need to go to prevention so that parents don't have to worry, don't have to give that extra hug in the morning. Interesting topic. Uh, first one, mental health needs. And uh, with the COVID that we had, um, it's been really hard for the, our youth in our school districts trying to uh, get a decent education. Not only has it been hard for them, some of these teachers are having a very difficult time trying to even teach you know, to these iPads and stuff like that too. So the teaching has been bad. And then the, the struggling that goes on with, with the youth trying to play catch up and uh, not even getting the full benefits of what the school actually has to offer to actually be in school. Uh, the, the other problem with the, the youth too, not only with the COVID, but you know, we got the school shootings and uh, you know, downsizing our police force was, was a drastic uh, mishap that, that has happened. Also along with uh, letting known criminals back out on the streets. Um, we can't even have our kids attend parades without being scared of it, being uh, drove over by, by uh, an SUV that uh, from a person that has been actually convicted several times as a fully uh, operating a vehicle and endangering people. So letting these people go is not, not safe for our neighbor, neighborhoods, it's not safe for our kids, whether they're in school, at home, on the field. We, we need a safe area and um, downsizing our police forces in it and letting criminals go without um, do justice it is not the way to go either. As far as funding for our special education students, um, I'm very well aware of special education students. Uh, my sister actually had uh, to go through that. Uh, she's a special student. And uh, I do know how important stuff like that is. Uh, one thing that I wish that would have been in our school, in the school at the time, was to find actually a little niche that she would have been good at. It was not until Years later, after she got out of high school, she actually found out that she was really good with art and cooking. And it would have been great for schools to actually find that little niche for them to advance after school. Uh, distribution of federal school safety dollars. Um, that's, that goes back to uh, almost the last question where we have to figure out how to, to uh, get, get the funds from one place into our school district. And uh, we, we definitely need safer schools. Um, I, not every school can be treated the same way. Some schools are gonna need more safety than others. Um, places further up north are probably not gonna need any, uh, as much safety as it is with downtown Milwaukee. So I figured there would probably be like a 
five different steps and to figure and to figure that out would be the uh, severity of where they're located at. Thank you. Will you take to re-energize interest in serving in this noble profession? You will have three minutes to answer this question, and we'll be starting with Mr. Kemp. Thank you very much, Ms. Straka. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. The first thing that I would do, or work to do, is to uh, repeal the um, collective bargaining provisions from Act 10. Um, obviously, we want to make sure that our teachers are, are um, are positive influences for our children. Act 10 did a number on the profession, without question. Um, we saw a spike in the amount of people that were retiring. There were a number of teachers that were younger teachers when I when I was in school that decided to retire early because of some of the things that they went through. Uh, a lot of teachers are, are vilified today because of, of the work that they do. I mean, right, right now what we see constantly happening is we have individuals stating that they want to arm teachers, but they don't trust them to educate our children. So we need to first make sure that we are building up the, the positive talk and the positive things that we have with, with respect to our teachers. Teachers right now do not have a say in the work condition because of a little collect, a little lack of the collective bargaining. And so we need to make sure we can restore that. Second, um, we want to make sure um, that children, or the teachers are incentivized. We have a lot of young people that want to teach, but maybe don't necessarily have an incentive to go into teaching. We could perhaps use funding to pay for their college if they took out student, student loans to make sure that if you teach in a public school or if you teach in a rural area for a certain period of time, that your education would be paid for. Um, we want to make sure that teachers have an opportunity to go to different schools and get different experiences. Um, going into an urban school versus going into a rural school, getting teachers into places where they're needed is important. So we can incentivize that by paying for student loans if they have acquired those. Um, another thing we could do is, of course, making sure that we're paying teachers properly. Um, it is, as I stated earlier, it's a difficult job. I, I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of people that are in here that are teachers. I could never be a teacher. I have enough, a hard enough time with my three kids. You can only imagine what it's like working with a classroom full of, of children. So we need to make sure that we give teachers a raise. It's very simple. Um, they're, they're underpaid, they're overworked, and quite frankly, they are not appreciated the way they need to. So I would make sure that we do everything we can to get teachers a raise in the state of Wisconsin and make sure that we're doing it in a manner that they're respected and we can restore their collective bargaining rights. Well, I, I think you <laughs> hit, the, hit, the nail on, hit the nail on the head there, uh, pointing the finger exactly where it should get for the question uh, on Act 10 and on COVID. Uh, the, Difficulties I think the teachers face are incredible. Give them so much credit for the work that they do, the trust that, that they must uh, instill uh, in parents to do the work that they do uh, in incredibly challenging times when they're being asked to be the teacher, the social worker, the therapist, security, uh, all kinds of things that are sort of more outside of the job description than they are in. Um, and they're incredible people doing incredible work. They should be treated as that. It is a noble profession. My mom was a teacher, as I said, uh, and the difficulties that, that she faced doing that job, I, I can't believe. Um, Republicans in the state have undermined teachers over and over. We heard just a minute ago that the teaching has been bad. Teaching has not been bad. It's been circumstances that have been bad. And teachers have had to work through that. And I think they deserve a lot of credit and thanks and have my, uh, certainly my thanks. I'm grateful for the work that they've done. Uh, and to undermine them with the conspiratorial attacks, with the nonsense that's been uh, spouted the last couple of years, I think is all part of the attempt to try to privatize schools for profit. 
And that was one of the routes to, I think, politically a route to get that done. And it's not one that should be done. This is a noble profession. All of us are who we are. Got to the place that we got to, thanks in part to teachers. So thank you, teachers. That's number one, I think, in our response is treat teachers with the respect that they have earned and deserve. That's easy to do because they've earned it. They deserve it. Number two, we should give them a hefty raise, give them all the benefits that they need so that they can live successfully, happily, uh, and, and do what they need to do to be successful in the classroom. And then third, we need to restore their collective bargaining rights. Nobody knows better what's best for teachers to get to the point to the question of what to do for them than teachers themselves. Let them be at the table and bargain for their rights, bargain for their pay, bargain for the safety of their classrooms, and bargain for uh, the future teachers who are coming after them. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, there was some discussion that uh, the amount of teachers entering the field has been dropping. I do have a Wisconsin policy forum, and it actually states the years and how many uh, teachers actually leave it and enter the workforce. And uh, after Act 10, there was a, a baby boom, and there was a, a few people, quite a few people that uh, left there. But from 2011, 2012, 2013, all the way to 2016, there have always been more teachers entering the field than leaving. Always. And I have the stats to show that. So as far as the, um, having teachers leave the workforce, um, I don't know where that has come from, but uh, I have the stats in front of me to show, show me and show you guys that um, every year we have actually more teachers entering than leaving. One thing that uh, removal of Act 10 has done is the teachers that have surpassed and gone above their duties, they're actually rewarded rather than waiting for that next step up to get appreciated. That was one of the problems that there was with the, uh, the previous system is a teacher wouldn't get recognized if they were new. And with this Act 10 finally gone, everybody is treated by what they do and how they perform. And uh, I think it was great. And the biggest benefits that there is right now is actually the rural and sub and the rural schools. They've been finding a really good increase. Um, a lot of the teachers actually will go there. They get more appreciated there than uh, they would in uh, the big, big cities themselves. And uh, I think once we get that mindset and get away from the union thought, these schools in these large cities will be just as better and good as the ones that's out in the rural areas. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so this is a noble profession. I, I like how that question was worded. Uh, teachers are the backbone of our society. I started my career as a teacher. My mom is a retired second grade teacher, as I mentioned. What the extremist politicians who jammed Act 10 through our legislature did was say to all of us, we don't care about teachers. We don't value teachers. We don't value education. Another profession that was attacked by Act 10, nurses. Both of these fields traditionally dominated by women. This hits home so hard for me. This idea that those of us in caring, caring professions do these things out of the kindness of our heart. I mean, many of us do get into these fields. I'm in, I'm in social work, I've worked in education my whole career. We get into these fields because we care about people, because we want to uh, support and help some of the most vulnerable people in our communities. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be paid a living wage, a wage that can support ourselves and our families. You know, when these fields dominated by women are constantly devalued in our society, what message does that send to our young people who are considering what career to go into, right? And even on this campaign trail, my qualifications have been called into question because of my, my work experience has been in social work and in education, even though I'm a leader in my organization and a leader in my field in the state of Wisconsin. So this is a historically huge problem in our society, in our culture, and Act 10 just really jam that home for us in Wisconsin. So 
you know, this is really personal to me, and I believe that we have got to, like Chad and Mike said, we have got to pay teachers more money. It's simple, it's not complicated, and we have to restore their bargaining rights. So, um, I also want to mention that, you know, there's a lot of good ideas from Assembly Democrats right now. Uh, in early 2022, there was a speed of bill, there was a bill introduced to help with teacher retention that included things like setting minimum teacher pay to have it tied to legislators' pay, which is a great idea, uh, create an hourly wage for student teachers, give bonuses to teachers who stay in the same districts, teacher pledge loan repayment program, oh, and establishing a, a non-voting seat for educators on a school board so that teachers have more buy-in. So there are good ideas out there, but again, we need to build the progressive power so we can make these things happen because this did not get through our extremist right-wing legislature that does not reflect what most Wisconsinites want. All right, candidates, if I could please direct your attention to question number four on your sheet. What are your thoughts on state funding of voucher programs? You will have three minutes to answer this question, and we will start with candidate Fair. Well, thank you, Peyton. I, I, like, I always liked extra credit and bonus points in school, so thank you. Uh, so, I, you know, we, we do need uh, to really look at this uh, in a data-based, evidence-based way. And what the data shows is that the voucher program does not work. It drains funding, drains resources away from public schools into profit-driven or other values-driven organizations that are not achieving the same things in the same way, in an equitable way that our uh, public schools should be. Again, education is a right, Taking money away from something that is a right doesn't do us any good. What it does is makes that pie smaller and smaller and smaller. That's the goal again. That's the Republican goal is to privatize schools and try to make some profit off of it. So our tax dollars should be uh, also under control of people who are elected. Sending our tax dollars to a private school takes it away from the school board members who are accountable to voters. And that doesn't sit right, that doesn't feel right. There's not something, there's not a, a level of accountability there that there needs to be. I think the funding, sort of back to the first couple of questions, the funding has to be in the control of local people who are elected. If you don't like what those people are doing, vote them out. That's the remedy. We don't need a whole new system. We need to just make this one work with the funding that's available and make sure that students are set up for success. You know, we have to first agree that education is a right, and if we don't, what we end up with is a system that will look similar to what we have in higher education, where if you can afford it, you can get it. Otherwise, good luck with the debt, good luck fighting for a scholarship, and that's not an equitable outcome. That doesn't lead to a bright future for students. It doesn't create opportunities or things for students to hope for and dream about, uh, and we should mainly not drain funding from public schools for profit. Uh, like I said in the introduction, I actually was in a private school and a public school. Um, being in the private school, I learned a lot. By the time I got into the public school, um, I could have probably took my GED at that time and probably passed. But uh, what I did enjoy in high school was all the shop classes and, and all the, the hands-on stuff that was available at that time. Um, even though my my English and arithmetic and all of that was was uh, above par prior to coming into the private to the public school. They yeah, learned private. Uh, the the experience of being in high schools was also great, and there was no big competition between the private school and the public school. Um, everybody got along well, so there was no um, battle between there and. I think I think it's great. It uh, by having schools more than one school available, it's uh, stop like a monopoly. You know, if you're the only one there, then who cares? But if you have competition just down the street, everybody tries harder. They try harder than that other school, and by doing that, the only one that wins 
is the kids. Thank you. I think it's fine if you want to send their kids to private school, but they're responsible for paying for it. As a state rep, will not support sending public dollars to unaccountable private schools. We need to invest in our public schools, our teachers, and our staff so that every kid gets a great education regardless of their zip code. I think our public schools are the best way to do that, and that means we have to invest in them and strengthen them for everyone. I do support charter schools that are part of a school district so that schools can innovate and learn new methods and ways to do things. These can be really effective when they're, again, part of a school district and held accountable for the funding that they're receiving. But uh, voucher programs are just another way to gut public schools of funding, and we got, already got plenty of that. We don't need to add to that. Like, come on. We, just, we have to invest in our public schools so that every kid has a chance to get a great education. Yeah, I think this is really simple. We've been sitting here for the better part of an hour talking about how our schools are lacking funding. This is a no-brainer. We, we, we cannot continue to send money to, to private schools and send public funds to private schools. I mean, Mike and Anna hit, hit on the same things that we're, we're all going to say. Private schools are often unaccountable. Or in some cases, completely unaccountable to those dollars. I want to make sure that the money that we're paying in taxes goes to the greater good, right? We want to do the best and the most that you can for the most people. Another thing, public schools are not businesses or monopolies, okay? If you're taking funding away from public schools, you're only hurting them constantly, okay? It's not a competition. What we want to do is making sure that we're lifting all boats and making sure all the children are getting a great education. So we can't continue to think that if we're taking money away from public schools that the solution is going to get better. What we need to do is innovate. Anna talked about charter schools inside of the public system. If we're doing things like that, that's going to make the schools innovate and think about how they teach in different ways. But taking and stripping away funding from schools certainly is not going to help. Um, the, the final thing really quickly, um, on a personal note, I never went to a, a private school. I went to a public school K through 12. I'm proud of that education. I want to make sure that our kids can get that type of education. You can do a lot of great things, and public school teachers, again, are some of the best people in the world. We want to make sure that they can show up to work with pride, go to work every day, be proud of what they do. But every time you hear someone say, we want to take money away from the public schools and send it into a voucher program, I can understand why teachers would get frustrated with that, because you're struggling for every dollar. Some of these teachers, quite frankly, are paying out of their pocket to make sure that classrooms have the materials that they need to teach the students they want to teach. So obviously this question is really simple. No vouchers if we can help it. Make sure that we fund the schools properly and, and go forward from there. Jonathan, help us with the last question of the evening. Candidates, if I could direct you to question nine. What differentiates you from the other candidates? In other words, why are you the best to represent our community? You have five minutes for this question. We will start with Mr. Graven. Well, what uh, differentiates me from the other candidates? Uh, uh, my vast amount of knowledge. Um, I've been uh, in Toma area, I've been down in here in Verona. So I can see uh, many different areas. Um, my daughter, she graduated from a tiny school called Elroy, uh, Tommy Thompson's home, home stomping grounds. And uh, so I can see the differences in many different schools. And I can see where one school would actually be stronger and where the other one needs just maybe a little more help. And I'm willing to try my best to make sure that all kids have a great and safe place to go to school, safe area, and no matter whether it be a voucher program, you know, like we were just talking about, or whether it be public or private, it doesn't matter. But they all need a good place to go to school. Um, as far as the voucher program, um, everybody pays it out of their taxes. So why wouldn't a tax payer at least get that money back if they're going to send their kid to a private school? 
So they pay anyway to the public, and then they're going to have to pay anyway to get their kid to go to a pub, to a private. And that's just double dipping, which is also wrong. Thank you. So I grew up in the military. My parents were both in the Army. I moved around all over the country. Um, sometimes I joke every boring state because I, we were always about to move to California, but then moved to Missouri instead. And Missouri was great. Uh, I, I moved to D.C. where I met my husband Brad after I went to school in Ohio, uh, and then moved to Wisconsin where I started my career uh, serving in AmeriCorps. I earned a master's degree in rehabilitation psychology from UW-Madison, and my husband and I now live on Lake Street with our daughter Lucy, who's seven. So this is a really special part of the state and really special town in Mount Gora. I feel really lucky to have found our community here. I bring to this race a unique combination of first-hand lived experience as a teacher, as an advocate for people with disabilities, as an activist in the fight for common sense gun safety, as a mom fighting for the world I want my daughter and all of our kids to inherit, and frankly as a woman at a time when our fundamental rights on our, to our own healthcare and our own bodily autonomy are under attack. That unique combination makes me the best candidate for these very challenging times. I will fight every day to bring your voice to the table in the State House and to create the progressive coalition necessary to make your voice count. This is the work of our time. We have to fully invest in our kids and their futures. This means investing in common sense gun safety, in strengthening our public schools, in protecting our fundamental rights, in stopping climate disaster in its tracks. We have to turn the state around. I ask for your support and I ask for your vote on August 9th. Yes, um, what differentiates me? I am one of, I'm probably the person that has spent, except for maybe Nathan, the, the most of, amount of time in the area. Uh, being someone that's born and raised here, I uniquely understand this community, um, having grown up in the Verona area and gone to school here, and then returning back after graduate school. Uh, that's the first thing. Secondly, um, this, this job is, is unique that we're all asking to do. Uh, being a legislator is, is difficult, uh, particularly when you're in the minority. There's going to be a lot of legislative bills that are going to come across the desk of the winner of this race, and that person's going to have to know how to read, interpret, and understand the law quickly. Um, and more importantly, you're going to have to be able to pull, to point in the direction, put a flashlight in the direction of the things that Robin Boss and, and uh, legislative Republicans are trying to pass, and understand what it means should that become law. Um, as an attorney, I basically spend my life reading the law and trying to work and figure out how it works and what it means and what we can do to make it better. Um, secondly, or I should say thirdly, um, I'm a person that tries to listen first. I think, with, you know, whether you're watching Fox News or MSNBC, we see people constantly talking, the, person, the people that always think they know the answer no matter what. Far too often people are, are unwilling to listen first. And so in my capacity in City Council in Verona, I found that it's much better to sit and listen to people first, understand their opinions, and know what their objectives are, so that once you understand that, if you don't agree, you can learn how to defeat what they're trying to do. And that's important. We're in a, we're in a severe minority, so you need to have the ability not just to yell and scream and throw bombs in the Capitol at the people that you don't like, but you have to be willing to listen first and foremost and understand where they're coming from. Then and only then can you, can you go at them and approach the problem and try and create solutions that bring, um, you know, make lives, uh, the lives of the people in the 80th district better. Um, I'm going to work hard as a state legislator. I love this community. It's done a lot for me. It's done a lot for my family. I want to stay here. I want my three kids to, to grow up in this area. And I want to make it better. And I think that if we first think positively and do the things that we know we can do, we can achieve those goals. Thank you very much. I hope to have your vote. Thank you. Well, thanks for uh, being here. Thanks for hosting. And uh, one differentiator that I noticed was I'm the only one to say education is a right. Public education, quality public education is a right. Uh, three other big differentiators that uh, have the most endorsements here from school board members and educators, more than 50 local officials endorsing me. Um, it's our city council in Verona that I served on, every member of that that I served with, 
is endorsing me as well as our mayor, Mayor Fitchburg. Uh, and uh, every Democrat who I've worked with on the county board, my colleagues, uh, are endorsing me as well. The ones who represent part of this district, the 80th district, are endorsing me as well. I also have the endorsements of AFSCME, or the public workers in the state, uh, and the local level, the SEIU healthcare workers, and the SEIU service industry workers, which I take as a great honor as a service industry business owner, uh, that they would uh, give me that um, recognition. The people I've worked with know I get things done, uh, and that's, I think, a, a big differentiator, getting things done. And the expertise in the main issue that we talked about tonight, education, long time expertise, in other issues too, health, public health, mental health, hunger, justice reform, disabilities, and uh, more things. Doing this job that I've had for 12 years that I love being an advocate for eliminating poverty. I've touched on a lot of issues. Uh, I'm proud of the work that I've done, proud of the accomplishments that I've had, uh, and proud of the experience that I've had. First six years of my career, I worked for Senator Russ Feingold, representing our state, uh, and working on things that really mattered for us, and really enjoyed that work. Been on the county board for three years, was on our city council in Verona, our planning commission, our parks commission. All of that experience adds up uh, to lessons learned in how to get things done, lessons learned on what works and what doesn't work, and lessons learned on funding. And that was the main thing, I think, the thing that we talked about tonight in budgeting. I'm accustomed to working in the Capitol, drafting legislation, reading legislation, uh, and running out of a genuine concern for my boy's future, for any kid's future, for any student's future, um, we have to be vigilant. We have to take on the extremists. We have to take on the problems that we've got. We have to do it in a calm, rational way. Building power is important, but we also have to work in a bipartisan way. We're gonna have a Democratic governor, please vote for Tony Evers, and most likely a legislature that's dominated by Republicans. Things won't get done unless they're done in a bipartisan way and have that experience. And I'm also wanting to do this out of my progressive values, do that in everything that I do, whether that's owning a business, being a parent, uh, or being an advocate, being a public servant, do it with my progressive values first, including making sure that our processes are fair and our, uh, and our outcomes are equitable, especially in education. Um, and I just wanna say thanks again for hosting, thanks for having us, and great questions from the students, and thank you all for being here, and I hope to earn your vote August 9th or early absentee. Thank you. All right, then, that concludes tonight's candidate forum. We again extend our gratitude to the candidates for not only participating this evening, but for considering a run for public office. We know the issues before us are complex, and we are thankful for the ideas expressed tonight. Please travel safely, everyone, and have a wonderful evening.